Welcome back, everyone. Against the backdrop of incessant insecurity occasioned by the activities of terrorists and bandits in the northern part of the country, especially in Plateau, Kaduna, Katsina, and Zamfara states, the Minister of State for Defense, Dr. Belo Matawali, has called for intensified operations against terrorists and bandits in the region. Consequently, while emphasizing the need for synergy amongst the services, the minister directed the Nigerian military to adopt a more proactive approach in decimating the activities of bandits and in dealing with insecurity in the region and the country at large. Now, to better understand security dynamics and diplomacy, let's speak with Group Captain Sadiq Garbashio, retired. He's a security consultant, he's also the CEO, Conflict Security and Development Consult Limited who joins me from our Buja studio. Well, Captain, good evening to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, and welcome to Politics Tonight. It's good to see you again, sir. Good evening, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. Right, so, you know, the last time we had a conversation was in May, and so since that time and now, uh, what's your assessment of the security situation in the country? Has, anything, has there been any improvement? Well, some improvements and some reversals. Certainly uh, within the period, uh, the last month that I was, was on your studio, we've had some uh, high-profile arrests. We've had some uh, rescues of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kidnapped uh, victims. All that is there for the positive side. But on the negative side also, we have had some horrendous attacks. We've had some reversals from the uh, military and security agencies. So it's, uh, it's a mixed picture. The, but And the bottom line will say we are not yet out of the woods. That is the summary of the situation. All right. So let's talk about military diplomacy. And I would like you to help us with a wider perspective to the term military diplomacy. What does it mean? How is it practiced? What are its objectives? Who are the actors? Well, uh, yes, it is really uh, mm -hmm. a time to look at uh, military diplomacy, especially with the recent visit by the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa Gwabin, to Niger. And we saw the tumultuous welcome he received from the, uh, mm -hmm. whether we call them the Niger leaders or the Niger junta, because it is a military regime there. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the background of that, we know since the clamp down by ECOWAS on Niger as a result of the military coup, there has been a kind of stalemate with no discussion going on, at least at the presidential level between uh, ECOWAS and Niger, or even between Nigeria and Niger. Mm -hmm. So to see, uh, you know, uh, a military delegation going and being received officially by the, uh, you know, by the, by the members of the uh, Niger ruling class, I think it is something to be happy about, and it gives us a glimpse of what can be achieved if we sometimes look at the aspect of military diplomacy. What is this military diplomacy? It's the use of military capabilities, assets, relationships to advance the course of uh, foreign policy or national security interests. And that's what we see doing. Because uh, with due respect, we'll see the, I mean, the relationship between Niger, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, to some extent uh, Guinea, and ECOWAS, and especially between Nigeria and Niger, has reached a stage where almost we can say talk at higher level, like maybe ministerial level or presidential level, are no longer possible. So to see, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the number one uh, military officer of the Nigerian Armed Forces going and uh, having a breakthrough, as opposed to the cold shoulder that uh, the Nigerian Republic has been giving all other delegations that went before, is something to celebrate and is something to study and uh, file away for future reference whenever there is such a, you know, dilemma between Nigeria and any other country. Uh, we see an effective use of this diplomacy in that uh, we have to understand that the security, because of our contiguity with Niger, we have security ties, we have economic ties, we have cultural and uh, so many ties between mm -hmm. us. Whatever affects Niger will ultimately reach Nigeria and vice versa. So to have the CDS going and extracting a commitment from the Niger leaders that they will continue to work with Nigeria to ensure that their security along the border areas is something that is uh, very, very productive. Since after the impasse with ECOWAS, uh, Niger did not say they are not going to cooperate with Nigeria, but certainly we were no longer confident 
of what they will do or what they cannot do regarding the uh, multinational joint task force. But with this visit and the assurances given to the uh, uh, chief of defense staff, I think it is uh, a very welcome development and it is something we should uh, study and make uh, recommendations for future application whenever the need arises. All right, uh, Group Captain, but generally, how important is the tool military diplomacy in the implementation of foreign policy and security of a country? And how does it benefit Nigeria? Well, uh, like I said, you see uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the impasse between ECOWAS and Niger, the traditional diplomacy, what I would call traditional diplomacy, either using the diplomats or Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, failed. We made attempt to send some delegations, which they were not sent away, but they were not really received warmly. So at that stage, we can say discussions have already broken. In fact, uh, like two, three weeks ago, Niger was even making claims that Nigeria is housing some elements, uh, some French elements that are hostile to Niger country. Our situation between us and Niger has never gotten this bad since uh, independence. So here we are seeing where traditional diplomacy failed. We applied military diplomacy and it is working. Not only working to improve the bilateral relation between Nigeria and Niger, it is likely if uh, ECOWAS leaders should also follow this uh, you know, template that has been set by this visit by the CDS, it is likely it will open doors for re-engagement with uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and, uh, and, and Guinea. Because the truth is that having ECOWAS as an entity, yes, it has advantages for all the members, and it will be a great disaster if the alliance is broken. So this is the use of um, uh, military diplomacy. Sometimes when uh, the traditional diplomacy fails, as we see here, when there is mistrust, military men have a way of engaging among themselves because of relationships that have been acquired either through operations, joint operations, peacekeeping, or uh, attending courses. Uh, from the, among uh, the, the Niger officers, you will find some officers who have done courses here in Nigeria either at the Armed Forces Command and Staff College in Jaji or at the uh, Defense College. You'll also find Nigerian officers who have gone to French countries and done courses and interacted with these officers. Sometimes you'll find, rather than president to president or minister to minister, sometimes personal relationship between these officers can open doors that have remained closed. And that is what we see playing out in this uh, scenario. All right. Uh, group Captain, for the purpose of clarity, and this is because you've talked about the need to further study and further recommendations, if military diplomacy worked for countries like America and China, how do you advise governments uh, on making this a long-term strategy for shoring up Nigeria's security? Yes, definitely. In fact, uh, it's not that we don't have... Uh you know, structures for military diplomacy, but as the saying goes, any system can be improved. Probably this is the first time we are seeing the actual use or the importance of this diplomacy. But apart from that, we've had engagement with other countries. As early as uh, 1964, you know, Nigeria did a bilateral uh, operation in Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania. Nigeria also has sent uh, training teams to set up some uh, countries, uh, militaries like uh, in Sierra Leone, the late General uh, Suraj and uh, I remember Colonel uh, Lowell Godebe, they were sent there to send up the military of that country. Relationships that are built because of this joint operation, all this peacekeeping, all these training missions, they last long. And whenever there's a problem where political leaders cannot talk, sometimes one military officer from another country contacting another officer would influence another country can open the doors and set the stage for the higher level political masters to discuss. That is the point I'm making. So as I'm saying, any system can be improved uh, for both the military itself and the political leaders. Seeing what happened with this opening of door by the CDS visit, it is time to really look at our you know, military diplomacy as another tool that can be used for strategic and uh, foreign policy initiatives. And for us also to really align our traditional diplomacy with economic diplomacy, with military diplomacy. Because all these tools sometimes, when one doesn't work, sometimes they work in combination. Sometimes one replaces the other because it is more appropriate. That is the point about saying about studying it and improving the systems, whether it is selection of our defense attaches, whether it is sending to our officers for foreign courses. There should be a system which, uh, in my humble opinion now, the system needs to be improved upon. 
All right, so Group Captain, this is my question. If you are if to advise government at this moment, what would be your own recommendation? My recommendation is uh, arriving from the success that we, we got from the CDS visit now. We should recognize military diplomacy and another aspect. So we look at all the elements of military diplomacy. Is it the officers we send for courses abroad? Is it the ones that come to our institutions here abroad? We should have you know, a record of all these uh, officers. Is it the alumni association, like in this uh, National Defense College here in Abuja, there is ANDEC, which is an association of uh, former students that studied in Defense College. It has officers from all over the countries. Such, uh, you know, such a, su such a record is very useful when something is happening between Nigeria and another country. You could, look, you could easily look through this relationship and see who has some leverage in Ghana in Guinea, in, in, in Gambia, or wherever it is. Do we have officers that have done, uh, you know, courses or have relationship with officers that are holding power in such country? Like I said, sometimes that you find that personal relationships, cosmetic relationships, attendance of courses relationships, sometimes they open doors more than the formal ways, you know, uh, of uh, uh, starting engagement and the escalating tension. This visit has escalated the tension between Niger and Nigeria, certainly. How we are going to leverage on it and continue, that is the point. Because like I said, every system needs improvement. We should look at systems of... There are many countries that have since realized the importance of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, you know, economic diplomacy. I have met a lot of officers, for, for example, from the Francophone countries here, who end up doing their uh, junior staff college here in Jaji. They come for senior staff college. They come for NDC. They end up being def uh, defense attaches for their countries here in Nigeria. As they are doing this, whether you like it or not, they are developing relationships with officers at different levels. They are developing relationships with uh, government workers. When eventually their countries have issues with Nigeria, they are in very good position to advise their country that I know Mr. A, I know Mrs. B, I know Mr. C, I know General this, or I know Police Commissioner this, and I can talk to him. Sometimes it is that police commissioner that will bring the attention of the Nigerian government to listen to what that country is saying. That is the point I'm trying to make. All right, Group Captain, thank you so much. Now, uh, you know, a video circulated over the weekend where bandits led by a notorious kingpin, Bilatorji, uh, gained access to a military armored personnel carrier in Zamfara State. And local security officials said, contrary to initial reports, the APC was not forcefully seized. Instead, uh, the vehicle became immobilized in a swampy area during a mission, prompting the troops to retreat. What does military training teach a commander to do in such situation? And was that followed here? Well, uh, yes, uh, the video came mm -hmm. out and uh, to the layman, it would look as if uh, the bandits have routed uh, our troops and taken uh, you know, the, the vehicle with them. But as we are made to understand, that's not what happened. Generally, uh, you know, any commander that is well-trained, and Nigerian officers are well-trained, when you have a piece of uh, equipment that is important to your operation, and it becomes immobilized in enemy territory, every officer who has attended uh, staff courses knows what he is supposed to do. What is he supposed to do? You first assess the situation. You assess the situation to see what is the, what is the extent of the problem. Is it that uh, the vehicle has become immobilized because of technical problem? Is it as a result of enemy action? Is it as a result of terrain? As soon as we realize that, you also radio back to the nearest unit or your higher headquarters, intimating them of your situation. Then you try to see, is, it, is it, this vehicle, can it be recovered? If it can it be repaired on the ground? If that cannot be done, what you do now is to use your troops to surround the area and adopt a defensive position because you know that you are in bandit area. They could attack you. While you are doing that and also trying to see whether you can salvage the situation by either, you know, uh, recovering the vehicle, using another vehicle either to tow it or winching or whatever it means, if that is possible. Obviously, in this situation, the commander thought that it's not possible to, to uh, you know, to, 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 to take the vehicle out of it. So what does he do? The next thing is that you have to think of the protection of your own personnel. In the protection of your personnel, you have to use an extractive method to make sure that your personnel are not harmed, especially where you have made an assessment and found the number. That uh, uh, MRAP, maximum there should be numbers of 12 troops inside. With the number of bandits we saw, we can go back and say the commander made a quick assessment because definitely there was no way 12 soldiers would be able to counter the number of bandits we saw surrounding that district. So that is to say, 
it is a situation where unless he extracts his troops, the troops are in real mortal danger. And you have to understand for the commander, his most important asset actually are the people. Even though the equipment is important, but his soldiers are the most important. So what the commander did by leaving the vehicle, in the absence that he cannot recover it, he cannot repair it, and he cannot stay to defend it, based on the number of, uh, of, uh, of enemy that is around the area, we can say that he made a very good decision, and that is what military training says. In other instances, he may decide, for example, to destroy even the vehicle so that it doesn't get into, into this. But this is a decision that the commander on the ground will decide. Is it necessary? I want to believe again here, I am second guessing the commander. He believed that there could be a chance that the Nigerian military can still recover that vehicle. So the issue of destroying it is not there. But taking his men away and saving them, I think this is what every commander will do given the circumstances on the ground. All right. Thank you, Group Captain. You need, let's take a break at this moment. Welcome back to Politics Tonight, everyone. Tonight, we're focusing on military diplomacy and the war against terrorism and banditry. And I've been speaking with Group Captain Sadiq Garbashir, who retired as security consultant and is also the CEO of Conflict Security and Development Consult Limited. Group Captain, thank you so much for staying with us on the program. So before we went on break, you pointed out uh, the fact that troops retreating was the right thing to do. But I'm sure... Some of them are just uh, still very confused. What kind of military vehicle did we see in that video? Would you agree with those who have said uh, that situation exposed uh, the weakness in Nigeria's security apparatus? Well, first I have to say, um, for the bandits, mm -hmm. such opportunities, they provide opportunity for propaganda. And I've already seen these stories making the rounds in many international media since it happened. But for practical purposes, for pragmatism, there is very little or nothing that the bandits can do with that uh, MRAP, which uh, stands for a mine resistance ambush protected vehicle. Uh, the, the vehicle we saw in that picture, if I'm right, is the ARA uh, MRAP that is made by Proforce, a Nigerian company. You know, it is uh, a vehicle that is designed to protect the soldiers against IEDs, against mine, against small arms fire. And as we can see, what probably you know, uh, led to the, uh, the, the vehicle getting stuck, if you look at the vehicle, it is, a, it is a wheeled vehicle. Normally, normally, wheeled vehicles have very difficulty negotiating terrain that is muddy. Ideally, probably, if we had a vehicle that is tracked, it would have been able to, it wouldn't be stuck in the mud. But uh, more, I mean, uh, wheeled vehicles have that tendency. Having said that, uh, the vehicle in itself is a very good effort by the Nigerian defense uh, uh, military and defense uh, cooperation to produce, uh, you know, vehicles that will be suited for our terrain. But like I said, in every incident, again, the military profession is a learning profession. What we find now with this incident is that probably the Nigerian army now will have to think twice about using such vehicles in Modi terrain. The vehicle is good for open, uh, you know, either it is savanna, whether it is desert, whether it is forest. But certainly because of the, of, of the weight of the vehicle, it is, uh, you know, so many tons of vehicles. So it is uh, very difficult sometimes to negotiate terrain that is muddy. And that's what we have. The, mud, the, the vehicle sank and it could not be extricated. And uh, definitely, again, other actions the commander must have thought he must have looked for reinforcement. But maybe reinforcement was not going. You have to understand all these calculations I am doing here sitting in your studio. Mm -hmm. The commander mm -hmm. probably has 10 to 20 minutes to make up his mind what he is supposed to do. So uh, it is easier for me sitting here, uh, you know, to, to call back on my training, on what I learned in Jaji to rattle this things around. The commander does not have that. Okay. Uh, because you've just said the military must now think twice. So what lessons would you expect the military to take away from the situation? And what advice do you have for security agencies? Well, lesson in this, this particular incident, like I said, mm. when I examine the vehicle and see that it is a, a, I mean, it is a wheeled vehicle, I know from experience that a wheeled vehicle is likely to have challenges in areas that are muddy. You would probably look for a vehicle that has uh, tracks. So, you know, that is what I mean, tracks are, uh, there are those that have wear, I mean, uh, iron, I, is, well, I call them iron tires. I don't know how to explain, okay. like chain, like chain wheels. Mm -hmm. Such vehicles are more because they are heavier 
their weight is more spread, uh, you know, generally around the vehicle, and they don't get stuck in such a uh, terrain. So probably, out of every incident, the military commander will always learn a lesson. So definitely, probably, when you have a terrain similar to the one we saw in Zampara, where it is swampy, definitely, maybe next time you will think that uh, uh, an MRAP, a wheeled MRAP, is not the kind of vehicle that you will use in that terrain. All right. Now, you know, the federal government says it is time up for these bandits and terrorists. You know, going by this latest directive from uh, Mr. President, asking military chiefs to relocate to Sokoto State. And from my own understanding, it looks like government is saying increased and consistent operations will weaken all their bases. Is this an effective strategy? And how much impetus and renewed vigor would it add to the fight against banditry and terrorism? Well, first, I will have to say we learn from history. And sometimes when we are making assessment, we see what happened in the past. Uh, this administration is not the first when besieged by setbacks in military operations to tell the service chiefs to move to the, to the front lines and remain there. We saw that during the President Muhammad Buhari administration. But using that as an example, the truth is that we didn't see, uh, you know, the expected positive impact of that movement of the service chiefs. So I have already seen people expressing pessimism based on what they saw before. So it is natural for people to be pessimistic. Will this movement by this uh, by the by the uh, you know uh, service chiefs, including the minister of state for defence himself, will it produce any expected results? Certainly, already I hear that the people in Zafara are already celebrating this announcement. However, the movement of a VIP like the minister of defence and the services to the front line has both advantages and disadvantages, depending on how you plan it, on how you execute it, how long you stay there, and what you are going to do there. Among the positives, among the positive, positive it will be a moral booster. The troop will say, the government has sent a minister, they have sent the service chiefs, they care, they want to come and see what is on the ground. It will also be a symbol of support for the armed forces that are fighting. It will also reassure the troops, it will give encouragement and motivation. It will enable the minister, if he really wants to do it, to get first-hand information of what are the challenges, what are the gaps that these people on the ground are having with a view to informing decision-making. It will also afford the minister the opportunity to hear from the troops and, uh, you know, uh, 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 hear their public, I mean, uh, the, the, their grievances. And uh, finally, which should not be the, uh, the main motive, it is also a public relations tool. It will show a public relations tool that the government is going. However, these are the advantages. On the other hand, or less properly handled, such a visit also had its negatives. Among the negatives, presently I can tell you the local commander is not happy with this visit. Why? When the, when the minister is there, service chiefs are there, I can see that commander in Zamfara on Sokoto dedicating at least a company just for convoy protection and protection of VIPs. This is the situation where he's already short of troops. So definitely if I'm the commander, this is not a visit that I'm happy with because it will divert my resources. So do you think Protecting more men should be, should be deployed the to... Group Captain, let me quickly come in there. Do you think more men should be deployed to Sokoto State? The problem of more men is a very tricky problem because is there any part where we're having security challenges where we don't need more men? Almost everywhere where the military is or the police are, we need more men. So the problem is that you are plugging, I mean, you are, you are, you are packing water from one room and then uh, pouring it in another room in a leaking, in a, in a leaking house. Mm. So definitely we need more men. But uh, I get even your point. I would even like to go more and say, instead of the minister going, sometimes it's even alternative to make sure that you send more resources to these soldiers that are there. Because like I said, they will divert attention for, for VIP protection for government and you know our big man. The minister cannot go in a small way. He's going in a big way. So he'll be carrying the resources. And secondly also, some people will see this purely as a publicity stunt. Publi purely as a public, Unless if people see immediate improvements. Again, that is the problem with such visits. When you hear a minister has gone, people have expectation they will see immediate changes. If those changes do not come, the government is going to receive more knocks that it is currently receiving. Because they will say, uh, minister has gone, services have gone, and nothing is happening. So these are some of the risks of these visits 
you know, there are advantages and disadvantages of it. However, while even we're thinking about that, I think whatever the government is going to do, I just hope they, as the military commanders, they should know the advantages and disadvantages of such a visit. Mm -hmm. But they should also consider alternatives way. If the government wants to show a renewed push, maybe why not maybe a video call mm -hmm. with the commanders, either with the, by the minister or the president, that should be another thing. How about, uh, you know, other indirect methods of, of engagement? But all the same, the government is committed that the minister and the service chiefs are going. But I must warn that from past experience during PMB, that didn't yield into mm -hmm. the results we are thinking. And people are skeptical whether this one also is another show. And also they have to, you know, understand the, the problems, I said, of diverting attention from military operation. And even the presence of, the v, of, the, of, of, of a VIP like the, like the, like the uh, minister, of, we have seen it happening in the Northeast. Sometimes when we have high-level delegation, that's when Boko Haram will try to do something spectacular. Because they lack publicity. They lack uh, this. So having a VIP for the local commander is a nightmare. VIPs attract bullets. That is the reality of it. VIPs right. sap uh, personnel from uh, the actual work to VIP protection. So all these are issues, you know, it's something you that needs to be weighed against the advantages and disadvantages. Yes. Absolutely. I get your point. But for us to, I mean, not have a repeat of the ineffectiveness of this particular strategy that has now been used again, from your own experience and training, what clear and actionable plan do you think they should go with as they relocate? Well, the minister um, of state, even though a politician, he has to talk like a statesman and not as a politician. He has to have a frank discussion with the commanders on ground to know what their lapses are. There are a lot of lapses. There are a lot of gaps. And he should come and eyeball the president and tell him. For the military leaders, sometimes this is missing. Uh, with due respect to my colleagues still in uniform, the Nigerian military officer has this reticence of telling the politician that you told me to do A, B, C. For me to do A, B, C, you must give me D, E, F. Our officers mostly don't like doing that. But what I want them to understand and what I them to note, in the statement released by the Ministry of Defense, there's a line which says, federal government has been supporting the armed forces. This is no longer acceptable. That line, that sentence to me, it is similar to the line we were hearing when President Muhammad Buhari was, uh, was the president. Several times he has said, I have given the military all they require, all the underlying word. Now, when your C in C is talking like that, that is to say the ball is in your court. If the C in C has given you everything and he has said so, and you are not producing results, then it is lack of capacity. So the point I am making is that the minister should speak like a, like, 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 like a statesman going to find out what actually is on the ground. The security uh, leaders should honestly tell the, 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 the minister the hard truth of what the situation is and the minister should come back and tell the president and then we want to see more resources that are going there. But in addition, in addition, it will not be out of the way for the minister to extract a commitment, either in terms of deliverables or timelines. This is what we are not doing. Uh, by my training, I do monitor and evaluation. When you don't monitor and evaluate something, you will just be going year in, year out, year in, year out. I think with this visit, it may not be public for me and you to hear, but I think the minister should be able to issue a deadline or give some timelines or some deliverables for the military to you know, achieve either in 100 days. I have this belief. I have this belief. That if, for example, the, minister, the president will say, I am giving you people 100 days to get me Turiji, I can tell you they will get Turiji. If they don't get Turiji, they will almost get Turiji. So, but we don't see that happening. We don't see this honest discussion between the politicians and the security chiefs. And I think it is high time because of the suffering of our people because of the food insecurity, because of the displacement of people, I think it is time to have that honest, you know, the civilians, leaders should do their part, the military personnel should do their part. That is my own advice. And sadly enough, there is this uh, blame game between both parties. You hear uh, politicians saying, or you hear the military saying, or politicians do not have the political will uh, to defeat banditry, and you hear politicians say, oh, the military or security chiefs are so uh, lazy with their approach. But because we all understand that a permanent solution is needed 
to ensure that criminals like bandits, terrorists, kidnappers, uh, cattle roasters are denied access to forest and farms where they hide before and after carrying out their nefarious activities. Group Captain, let's be realistic. Is there a winning strategy to this? Is there a, sorry? Is there a winning strategy the last part of to your this? Question. Yes. Is there a winning strategy to that? A winning strategy, yes. The winning strategy is honesty, transparency, and dedication in every person's sphere of work. There is the part that the political leaders will do. What I mean by political leaders, it runs from the president to the minister of defense to the members of House of Orange. They have a big role to play. They are the ones who appropriate funds. They are the ones who are supposed to follow the funds and make sure they are used. Then there is the part that the military personnel will do. The military personnel on, I think it is directly telling the political master, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this. And without this, I cannot achieve this. They should not shy away from facing the, the, the political leaders and telling them. Now, you spoke about uh, the political master saying the military is lazy and the military is saying that it's political matters. To me, this is a democracy. Nigerian population did not select the military, I mean, did not vote for the military heads. Who they voted for are the president, the minister of defense, and the, uh, uh, the, the National Assembly members. Mm -hmm. They are the ones in charge. This is democracy. That's what you call the concept of civilian control of the military. It is a tenet in democracy. That is to say, in the final analysis, it is the political master who is elected by the people of Nigeria rather than the uh, security chiefs who is in charge. What do I mean by that? I take it to your home. If you have a house girl who you say is lazy, is not doing the work, I mean, what do you do? You are the employer. You are, you are the employer. He is the employee. So I think the power is with the employer. But for this, I mean, the political masters do their bit. They must also ask themselves hard questions. Do they release money to these people? Are there people correcting bribes before they, they release funds to the military? Are there people insisting to take contracts from defense budgets that have nothing to do with operational capacity? All these are questions I don't have answers to, but I'm throwing them out there from the executive branch to the legislative branch, they should answer such questions. Because sometimes when you see people ringing their arms, security, 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 you find that many of us were guilty in what is security. If you are a legislator and you approve funds, but you don't release them until the military gives you something or the security agency, you are also a bandit. If you are a minister, you don't follow to see what the services are doing or the money, you are as guilty as the bandit, Bella Turiji. That is my opinion. All right. You know, we've talked, about, we've talked about the role of politicians and military personnel. And because these violent attacks have now escalated to the gruesome murder of traditional and community heads, I mean, most recent is the killing of the district head of uh, Gatawa Isa, that's Mohammed Bawa. Just like the Northern Elders Forum has said, this is a stark manifestation yeah. of the chaos affecting northern part of Nigeria. So for you tonight, how much effort or work should you, or would you say, is in the hands of the traditional institutions in the Northwest? Well, um, traditional institutions over the years have lost their relevance and their power due to so many, uh, mm -hmm. so many factors. Maybe the uh, evolution of our, of, our, of our communities as a whole. Before, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, 58 years old, 59 years old, mm -hmm. I could remember mm -hmm. when I was growing up, when my father, I am from Sokoto originally, but I grew up in Kaduna, in a place called Kabbalah. When my father receives a visitor from Gusau, he has to take that visitor to the local chief and tell him, this is my uncle, he is here, he is going to spend so number of days, this is what is bringing him, or he's going to stay with me. You see, so check and balances ensure that, you know, any person, a traditional ruler in a local community can account for everybody. He can account for a visitor. We do not have that. When they were looking for, there is this, uh, what is it, uh, Bologna, Bologna kidnapper many years ago. He went into a community and hired a house and stayed there. For a long time, nobody knew he was there. Also, even the way we do our intelligence services, it has changed. I am old enough to remember in those days when we have the DSO, I mean uh, NSO, Na National Security Organization, before the DSS. You will go and find a security operative in a village market, selling granite, 
but is gathering information. I do not think our intelligence services any longer do that kind of business. What do you find now? Everybody wants to be in Abuja with a court like my own, with dark goggles, for running after a vehicle or VIP vehicle, just to be seen in Abuja. That is where all the intelligence work is doing, is, is going. We have to go back to the basics, to the traditional institutions, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to give them the role that they were playing before. For the intelligence services, because to be honest with you, let's talk of Belletrugi. Belletrugi must be buying food. He must be buying fuel. He must be selling cows or buying cows from the local market. So the DSL officials that are flooded in, in Abuja, that is not where they are going to do the work. They should go to the markets in Zamfara, in Katsina, enter the local markets, plant people who are selling corn, plant people who are selling granules, plant meshai, plant... Uh, this, these are things that used to be done before, and it worked. But everybody now is there for this. In fact, even the DS that are supposed to be operating, you know, covertly, now they carry guns and uh, doing James Bond 007. You meet a DSS man, he will tell you, I'm a DSS officer, bringing himself up. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it is the antithesis of uh, intelligence work. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody should be with an intelligence officer without even knowing that it's an intelligence officer. Mm -hmm. So honest, we have to people, many people are failing. But unfortunately for the military, they are at the end, they are at the end, they are at the sharp end of the sword. What we see is the failure of the military. But behind the failure of the military, there are multiple failures. The truth is that if the president really wants to know, he should know how do the military, when they submit their budget, do they bribe people to get their budgets? The president and the minister should find out. Who are the people collecting bribe? Do they release their money? I mean, to be honest with you, if we want to be brutally frank, you will find that part of the problem of the, of the, of the insecurity is corruption. It's corruption. At every point, from the, from the, from the, from the, from the uh, drafting of the budget, to passage of the budget, to the release of the money, something has to give. Something has to give. Now, if the people are pinching along the way, you do not, uh, uh, you know, you may understand, of course you don't excuse it, but you may understand if finally the local commander on the ground, if also said, I'm going to pinch some of the money from the personnel's uh, feeding allowance, he will pinch that because he knows along all the line people have been pinching. And what happens? The, the, the final soldier or the final policeman on the floor, instead of to be very diligent, checking every vehicle, he will be saluting everybody that is passing, that will give him 10,000 naira. Mm. So much so that, even if I'm carrying a human head in my boot, honestly, if I keep a word of note on my seat and be tipping, I, don't, I can travel from Abuja to Kaduna, nobody will check me. So, there are failures or multiple failures, but again, like I said, people elected the president, they elected the minister, they elected the... Uh, the, the members of the National Assembly, they did not elect the security, security chiefs. So if anything fails, if anything fails, during Buhari administration, I always laugh when I hear National Assembly members saying we have passed a vote of no confidence on the security agencies. Yeah. That is a very weak and a dereliction of duty. Is that all you can do as a National Assembly member? So everybody should wake up and do his work if we are to get out of this uh, quagmire. Group Captain, we must have this conversation another day because, I mean, you've raised so many issues tonight, but because of time, we may not have time. We do not have time to go into them. But before I let you go tonight, help me find some answers to some, I mean, this question. Is there a place for how protection payments to militias has escalated conflict in the north, especially in communities where resistance occurs when a community pays a militia to protect them? So if they refuse to continue payments, the militia responds with violence to punch the community and instill fear. Would you say this may have escalated these killings? If I get you, you are asking whether payment to the militia is encouraging the banditry or what? Uh, absolutely, that's it. Yes, well, it is a chicken and egg problem. If you are a villager and your village has been besieged for the past one year, Without seeing security presence, you are at the mercy of the, of the bandits. Would you pay or would you resist and be shot in the absence of government presence? So to be honest, I sympathize. Yes, it is a chicken and egg problem. The more money you pay for the people, the more you, know, you encourage them to be doing it. But however, for a peasant farmer who, ha who ran the risk of either his wife or his girl child being snatched and ravished by a bandit, or less he pays, or who risks not being allowed to farm unless he pays uh, some tax for the bandit and he does not see a police inside. He does not see a military man inside. 
I, I think uh, it will be unfair to tell that person again not to pay for his own uh, for his own peace of mind. So unfortunately, still the the, the 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 blame should not be on the person who pays. The blame should be on government that made it so that made itself so weak that bandits are threatening people and getting away with it. That is how I see it. I don't like this uh, tendency of saying that uh, the local population, they are the ones. No, I think they are victims. If they had security around them, they would not be paying bandits. Nobody wants to go and fall for a whole year and end up giving 50% of the money to a bandit. All right. Thank you so much for uh, this robust uh, perspectives uh, to our discussion tonight. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with group captain Sadiq Garbashio, retired a security consultant, CEO, Conflict Security and Development Consults Limited. Thank you so much, Group Captain. Thank you for always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.